Thank you all for coming today. Thanks for braving the snow and the, uh, the high winds. Glad everybody could be here. Uh, I'm Mike Pregent. I'm a fellow at the Hudson Institute, and I'm honored to have my colleagues here on, on, on stage with, with me today. This panel, this panel will be able to talk about everything that's going on in Syria, but of course we're going to start with the news that broke today. Uh, before we do that, I'd just like to introduce my panel. Uh, Jennifer from the Institute of Study of War. If you haven't had a chance to check out her podcast on who's actually fighting in Syria, it's a great podcast. It's on the Wall Street Journal Foreign Edition, and you should check it out. Very strong performance there. We have we have Bassem. Bassem is from Syria, former Syrian diplomat from Deir Azur. And I'll let each say something about themselves as well. And of course, Elon Berman here, who will talk to us about what Russia is doing. Uh, we're going to do this a little different. We're not going to do our traditional eight-minute opening statements and then do that. We're just going to kind of talk about the current situation, what's happened in the last 72 hours, have the panelists address those issues, and then we'll open it up to questions uh, towards the end. Um, having said that, let's talk about what happened in the last 72 hours. So on Sunday, I like the language coming from Secretary Mattis where he, he, he changed the language as it relates to what Assad is doing with chemical weapons in Syria. He said any attack where gas is weaponized would, would result in a response by the United States. Well, that would cover chlorine gas. The only problem is, as we all know, Russia's standing in the way with their no vote at the UN Security Council. Uh, which leads me to the second development. So Monday, Nikki Haley actually spoke at the UN Security Council and had some very strong language. Uh, language that we want to hear and language that, that, uh, that briefs well to not only the Syrian people, uh, but to Iran, to Russia, and to what the president wants to do. And then, of course, we have the news today uh, where Secretary Tillerson will be replaced by Pompeo. And uh, as, as an Iran watcher, I think it's good. Now you, ha you don't have the CIA having to convince State Department that Iran is bad or that Russia is bad or that Assad is bad because now State Department will be in line with what the agency has been telling them all along and what, the pre what they've been telling the president all along. So with that, um, I'd like to, uh, to start off with asking each panelist, what do you think about this change at state and, and does it portend better, better policy in, in Syria? I'll start with you, Jennifer. Sure. So I think I'll start um, by framing what the Syria strategy had been um, that Secretary Tillerson had announced and my questions moving forward as uh, Pompeo comes into this role. Secretary Tillerson, of course, gave a speech at Stanford earlier this year and outlined uh, five major U.S. policy goals inside of Syria. And he did identify Iran as a primary threat to U.S. interests inside of Syria um, and the wider region. And he did state objectives vis-a-vis -vis Iran that included diminishing their force posture in Syria and reducing their influence uh, more broadly. However, the largest question has been, what is the practical component of that definition of the threat inside of Syria? What will US forces and other US uh, policy instruments be applied towards in the near term as an, object, as an uh, identifiable and achievable near term goal? We haven't really seen that. So what I'm hopeful is that uh, Secretary now Pompeo uh, will actually be able to clarify what the policy objectives are in time and space inside of Syria um, and give you know, a, a real manifestation of the use of American policy instruments in that theater, which we haven't really seen to date vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Right. And, and again, the, 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 the title of this panel is Consolidating Losses and Gains in Syria. And who, who, who's consolidating gains and who's consolidating losses? Hold, that, hold off on answering that. I'll let you both talk about Pompeo and Tillerson and then, and then address that question afterwards. Yeah, uh, thank you for having me here. For the last year, when Mr. Tillerson was Secretary of State as a Syrian living in Syria and watch what's going on in Syria, we didn't see there's any major change from US policy from Obama to Tillerson for the last one year. Uh, it's become much worse, actually. Uh, for the first time, we have this escalating zone in the south of Syria that is only five kilometers. It gives space uh, between the Iranian forces and Jordan. This never happened. Nobody can expect such things. So I think with Mr. Tillerson, he have all the goodwills to do something on Syria. He doesn't. He is new for this 
building where he's, he works, he used to work, and he doesn't have his own stuff, so he built on what already was exist with Obama people. With Mr. Pompeo, I think the difference will be that, he, as you mentioned, he knows the establishment now. He will come with his, I assume, he will come with his team. Uh, he identified the problems very well. There is no way to say we will uh, have a new policy against Iran in the Middle East without starting in Syria. So for me, always I look what the American will do in Syria, not in Iraq, not in Lebanon, because the fight is still there. They are still there. Things are still evolving. Uh, Mr. Bombeo, when he was congressman, he was very much supporting the, the Syrian people, the revolution. He had many statements, many letters to Obama administration to say you should support the people. When he became the head of CIA, um, he did two things. Uh, doesn't go with his statement when he was congressman. Uh, first one, he stopped all the CIA projects uh, supporting the FSA, which I agree with it. It wasn't good programs. And it was the first time when the CIA, according to New York Times, Washington Post, they sent someone to Damascus. It doesn't make sense with the same person. So now he's coming back to be Secretary of State. As a person, he was very clear about his position when he was congressman. He was free. He was talking about very clear about Iran, about supporting Syrian. When he comes to the government, I think he will be, in a way, he will work with the big strategy, what they want to achieve as big. So for me, I will see what they will do in Syria. We have two hotspots, very clear, one in the north of Syria, one on the south. Um, the previous administrator or previous secretary of state, they didn't do much for protecting them, US, US interests or Syrian people or the neighboring. Uh, it's very clear now to have to watch what's, what's, what will happen, and that will give the indication how much this will be different from two secretary of states. Thank you, boss. So I, I sort of feel like a little bit like Groundhog Day because we've had this conversation on this stage before about the fact that, well, at least in my view, personnel is policy. And the fact that there's been a tremendous amount of chaos in the administration, there hasn't really been consistent leadership in terms of Middle East policy, has really impacted the clarity of the administration's vision detrimentally. Um, and I think that's true, certainly in the Syria space, uh, because you, you hear some, you've heard quite a few pronouncements, Tillerson's speech being only the most recent one, but not a lot of translation into concrete action. Um, with regard to Director Pompeo's appointment, or presumptive appointment, um, I think uh, what the media is focusing on is Iran, right? Uh, Pompeo is an avowed Iran hawk. Uh, there's an expectation that he's really going to take a sterner line. I would make the argument that, that you actually have two Iran problems. One is how to sort of uh, either fix or nix the JCPOA, the Iran deal. And the administration has been uh, notoriously vague about what fixes are sufficient in order to keep the framework. And that's, I think, intentional in part because the idea is to pressure the European community to do more. But the reality is nobody quite knows what's sufficient. Uh, and so it creates some ambiguity. I think that's going to be clarified. Uh, Director Pompeo is avowedly not a fan of the JCPOA, and I think that's going to change. But to me, the heavier lift is precisely what Bassam said, which is that a tremendous amount of benefit from the JCPOA has already been conferred to Iran. And you see that from Iran's growing regional profile. And pushing back against that regional profile, putting Iran back in a box, for lack of a better description, is the more difficult part of the Iran strategy that the administration announced last fall, but they really haven't been implementing up until now. And I think personnel is policy. And I think you're going to see some movement in that. Whether that translates into a more coherent strategy with regard to Syria specifically, I'm not sure. I'm hopeful, because my sense is that a lot of what the administration needs to do in order to put Iran back in that box begins and ends in the Iraqi-Syrian theater. Right. What's interesting is uh, the more difficult something is, it usually means it's probably the most, probably the, the right thing to do. And because it's difficult, we, we shelve it. If it's difficult, that actually, to me, it means this is what we should do. And how do you stop that? So consolidating gains and losses. Who's consolidating, consolidating gains and losses, in your opinion? Sure. So the Assad regime and its external backers, Iran and Russia, are certainly in a phase of consolidation of their gains. They're actually making additional gains um, in addition to trying to shore up gains that they've achieved to date in places like Aleppo. Um, they're, of course, attempting to repeat their siege uh, starvation and then forced surrender of Aleppo in the eastern Ghouta suburb of Damascus, which is critical not only to securing Assad's power base in the Syrian capital, but also, of course, assisting Iran in its build-out of 
uh, proxy networks across Syria and its um, consolidation of strategic positioning vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Um, so the pro-regime coalition more broadly, of course, consolidating gains inside of Syria. I think the Trump administration did have a intent to consolidate American gains in Syria to date. We, of course, saw the decision to retain U.S. forces in eastern Syria and actually to augment those forces with additional State Department personnel. That was a strategy in part to consolidate our gains against ISIS and hopefully then to pivot towards larger American objectives inside of Syria to include at least notional objectives vis-a-vis -vis Iran um, and the Assad regime and other issues. What we've actually seen, however, is that the American decision to remain in Syria did not actually give us as much leverage as I think we perhaps hoped. And it actually led to a new phase of American forces and American policy being directly challenged, both by the pro-regime coalition in its escalation against the US and Eastern Syria with the Russian uh, contractors, but also, of course, by Turkey, right. which is now actively at war mm -hmm. uh, with our local partner, the, the Syrian Kurdish YPG. But actually, Turkey is increasingly attriting the wider Syrian democratic forces into the fight in Afrin in northwestern Syria. So it's not just Turks versus Kurds anymore. The U.S. is actually losing the Arab components of the Syrian democratic forces that are critical to securing our gains against ISIS. So one of the biggest risks I'm worried that we're going to take in the next few weeks and the months thereafter is that ISIS actually does still retain forces in southeastern Syria and the ability to retake terrain. They've been retaking some local terrain from the regime. And I think there's a very real risk that we, the U.S., and our local partner will start to lose terrain as well. It, it seems as though Afrin is becoming a, a magnet for our SDF forces, not only the YPG, but like you mentioned, the Arab forces that are key to holding gains against ISIS and Raqqa and Deir Azor. Can, can we bring up the map from ISW? Um, it's becoming a magnet issue. And anytime you have a hold force that feels more loyal to something west of the Euphrates than holding territory against ISIS east of the Euphrates, that's a problem. And that's, that, that's, that's something that we need to address. And uh, how do we do that? And I'll come back to you on, on after this, you know, what, what should the U.S. do to, to, to reinforce gains and, and, and increase gains? But uh, the, Af the offering issue is, is a big deal. We seem to have a policy east of the Euphrates and one that's different west of the Euphrates. Sure. Um, I, had, I had somebody from the, from the NSC uh, push back against something I put out saying, listen, the guys west of the Euphrates, they made their bed with Russia and Iran, so they, you, know, you've got, you have that message where, where it says they kind of deserve what's happening to them. But when you're a, a special operator on the ground embedded with a YPG force east of the Euphrates, it's hard for you to make the case to your YPG partners that, hey, those guys on the west side, they, they, you know, we're not really working with them. So whatever happens to them, even though they're related to the YPG guy you're working with, it doesn't sell well. For anybody who's ever worked in this space where you've been an embedded advisor or a, a case officer or a, a special forces advisor on the ground, it's hard for you to have to translate U.S. foreign policy to the people you're working with when you hear three conflicting messages. One from Tillerson telling Erdogan, be precise when you target the YPG in Afrin. Doesn't sell well. Uh, Matt is saying that the YPG as part of the ISDF are, are a valuable partner in the war against ISIS. And then having the spokesperson for Operation Inherent Resolve saying that the YPG are instrumental in helping us target 150 ISIS fighters. The, when, when, a, when an embedded advisor has to translate policy from three different sources at the national level down to the ground level, east of the Euphrates, it, it doesn't bode well. So I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and go to you there. I have two answers for your yes, questions. Yes. Uh, number one about Syria, number two about Afrin. So Syria, unfortunately, is not anymore Syria that we know. I don't see it that it will come the way it used to be before 2011. We have uh, 5 million refugees, 7 million IDPs, 60% infrastructure has been destroyed, no services. Uh, God knows how many people are arrested, how many people disappeared. We have a lot of problems. If the war stopped today, we need generations to fix what we have today. The mosaic or fabric of Syrian society has been destroyed. The sectarian is going to up. Uh, uh, people losing the values because they believe in the real value that the West or the developed world will come for defending the Syrian for the, the nobles norm, like human rights, like democracy, like uh, elections, like this kind of basic 
uh, ask, when the revolution started, they didn't ask Assad to leave. They asked for uh, dignity. That's it. It's, it's only dignity. And, and he moved it in that world. After seven years, when Tullius asked any Syrian, what do you think about the human rights? They say, bad words. Or what do you say about any Western values, wherever, from which country it comes, they say, don't believe it, don't buy it. We, we look what happens to us. So th this is the losing part, that United States and the West, they lose the, the moral values to defend their people. I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about very human rights. When more than f uh, half a million people killed, and we watch. And we just make statement. I can make statement. And President Trump can make statement. But nothing changed. So I think this is, should be revisited on all, all, all structures, all levels. Um, the organization that they are working on the human rights, on the government who's put millions of dollars every day for a project for human rights. And on reality, nothing happens. It's, it's reverse. Uh, the more killing continue, the more people lose hope, the more extremists gain without doing anything. They just, they, they have this huge number of people who can re be recruited just to revenge, not recruited for ideology, rather than re re recruiting for revenge for their own families. Uh, when we talk about Syrian uh, Turkish border, we have 200,000 people living IDPs on the Syrian part of the borders with, with literally no service, literally nothing. They're just sitting on the, on the borders, doing nothing, waiting for Godot. Um, we always tell whoever the country that they have the money, if you don't address these people, not only ISIS, God knows who will come to tell guys, we'll give you the service, the food, basic of everything, and go and kill X, Y, Z to revenge. Uh, the Iranians are in Syria now. They've never been in Syria. They have never have a food in Syria the way they have it today. Um, the regime, in theory, is winning. But if you look deep about the component of the regime forces anywhere, is more than 60% pro-Iranian militia from different nationalities. Um, I, think, I don't think the regime is winning as a regime, as a Syrian, as Assad. I don't think he's winning. He's benefiting from the winning, but basically Iran is winning. Russia claims to be winning, but basically they cannot do anything without Iranian. Uh, zero. Ir Russia just provides the air force, air cover, and the Iranian goes and eat everything. Uh, Russia tried to be superpower, and I think they failed big time because at least if we compare the economy, Texas economy bigger than Russia, or, or uh, California is much bigger than the whole Russian economy. Uh, so they try to impose themselves by killing people, and we have we hear be back to the the norms, the values of the the human rights. The people are accepting that process. United States is the big loser, big time. Uh, because they lost the values, they represent United States superpower not because of the money or the or the economy. It's because of the values. When people or the immigrants they came to United States, they say because it's freedom. We can say what we want to say. Uh, now we cannot see United States is the same United States in in the whole region. Uh, I'm not talking about uh, political things or military things. My friends, colleagues, they can describe it much better than me. Um, how, how things is the uh, United States is just losing by not being United States. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> we seem to be the only power not using our superpower status in this country. But you, you mentioned Russia is one and talk to me about Russia. So but I'm Russia singing doing? my song, right? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> my friend. <laughs> yeah. So in the question of consolidating gains, I think it's necessary. I'm going to do this as fast as I can, but I think it's necessary to sort of paint a picture for why Russia is in Syria in the first place and why it's going to stay there, why it's not going anywhere. So we're now two and a half years into the Russian military campaign. And despite multiple pronouncements by the Russian uh, sort of command authority, uh, they're not going anywhere. Uh, they're reconfiguring the shape of their forces. They're not really uh, sort of pulling back. Uh, the sort of the Putin's announcement back in December of withdrawing the main part of forces was more a sort of a retrofitting and a sort of a repurposing of the types of forces that they need rather than a pullout. So if you go back and you look at September of 2015, if you look at what was motivating the Russians, they were essentially trying to do three things. One is that at that time, the uh, balance of power in the Syrian theater was tilting against Assad. And the Russians were concerned that their principal basing in the region, right, which was, uh, had been since the early 70s as part of an agreement that the Soviet leadership hammered out with the Assad regime, the uh, Hafez al-Assad regime, um, was based in Tartus. Uh, would go away, potentially. 
uh, and so, right, so the sort of the, the central part of being a great power, of conceiving yourself as a great power, is that you have the ability to project power globally. So Russia was, at that time, confronted with a situation where, under a conceivable array of circumstances, they would lose the ability to project power into the Eastern Med. Um, and so the intervention was intended to forestall that. The intervention was also intended to politically change the conversation. We, we always forget, particularly when we sort of do Middle East pa panels, that Russia is actually fighting two wars simultaneously. There's a second war going on in Ukraine, and it's been going on. And by the way, the Russians, uh, I, at that time, in September of 2015, were about a year, a year and a quarter into their Ukraine intervention, and it wasn't going as well as they thought. They very clearly assumed that uh, this sort of uh, undermining of Ukrainian sovereignty, the sort of the uh, stage-managed referendum in Crimea, would create this domino effect that would allow them to consolidate gains in Ukraine. That didn't happen, and that was rebounding very negatively in Russian politics. So in many ways, uh, and I think it still is, uh, Syria is an attempt by the Kremlin to change the conversation, to demonstrate their ability to sort of to uh, act decisively, strategically in a different theater. But the most important part, and this is sort of, the, I think, the most under, underserved argument, is that Syria is actually a defensive strategy uh, for the Russians. And it's a defensive strategy because Russia has a jihadi problem. Um, Russia is a country of uh, about roughly 146 million people. Uh, Russian Muslims uh, are somewhere 14 and 15% of that. It's been diluted a little bit because they added 2 million Slavs for, uh, when they annexed Crimea. Uh, but the trend line is that while the overall Russian population is declining, absolutely, Russian Muslims are actually expanding as a percentage of the population, right? They divorce less, uh, they, they, uh, they abort less, they drink less, um, they reproduce more, right? The fertility rates are positive. But Putin has constructed over the last decade <clears throat> a, this ultra-nationalist state in which there's really no room for Russia's Muslim minority. So Russia's Muslims have to belong somewhere. And so you're seeing this very clear radicalization trend among Russia's Muslims and mobilization, uh, uh, sort of leaving the, the borders of the Russian Federation and migrating to the Middle East, to the point where Russia is now, or at least was before the collapse in late 2017, the single largest contributor as a nation state of foreign fighters to the caliphate. You make it sound like there's a strategy there. Is this, is this something they're doing by themselves, or is they being pushed in this direction by? So I think it's both. Uh, part of it is organic. Uh, a lot of the, if you sort of look, have looked at sort of the reports coming out about sort of fo foreign fighter migration to the Middle East, a lot of it is self-organizing. <clears throat> but there are a lot of circumstantial reports from the Russian press that suggest that uh, they're not being impeded by the Russian security services. That you know the, the best uh, sort of the best strategy is to sort of to aid their exit and then to go abroad and to kill them in the Syrian theater, so you don't have to worry about them coming home. So in this context, in this context, Russia's continued presence in the Syria space becomes really important as a function of domestic stability within the Russian Federation. And we've heard that from Western diplomats as well, that whoever comes to Syria should, should die here and not necessarily go back. Uh, but you wanted to say something. Sure. I, I definitely agree that there is part of the counterterrorism framing in the justification for Russia's first entry into Syria and then decision to stay. However, the one thing the Russians haven't actually concretely done is fight terrorists inside of Syria. Um, they have focused their military campaign on destroying the elements of the opposition that were willing to negotiate with Assad. They only supported counter ISIS operations in order to beat the US to oil fields and to constrain US influence, um, and of course then to gain access to the revenue from those oil fields. Um, but the other thing I think that is important that, that you alluded to that I just want to uh, draw out here is that the Russians also haven't actually uh, defeated the main jihadist threat that they face to their bases, which is concentrated in Idlib province, right. um, which has not been a priority of the pro-regime military campaign until recently. Um, and when the Russians, the Iranians, um, and notional uh, Assad forces actually launched an offensive into Idlib, their objective was first to, to consolidate control of the highway connecting Hama up to, to Aleppo province, and they actually were halted. Um, in part by major Turkish support to armed groups there. So the Russians do actually still face a major jihadist threat to the Syrian coast, and so does Assad. Um, and that threat means that despite the fact that the pro-regime coalition appears to be winning and has in fact made a lot of gains, this war is very far from over. And what I actually expect that we will see in the next phase 
is Al Qaeda and other jihadist groups in Syria use their high end military capabilities to include suicide bombers um, and IEDs to undermine the stabilization efforts mm. in recaptured areas like Aleppo in order to keep the costs high for the Russians, the Iranians, and the Assad regime and preclude an actual victory in this war. So I think the one thing we can be sure, mm. unfortunately, is this is that this war is on track to continue, and therefore U.S. policy has to recognize the fact that we're not approaching a conclusion, even you know, a, a uh, unjustifiably inhumane one. So we'll go to Elon, and then we'll go to Bassam. Uh, so no, I, I think that's absolutely right, and and it's useful always when we think about this to remember that all politics is ultimately local, because the shape of what Russia looks like in the Syrian theater now reflects the fact that uh, this conflict, like the Ukrainian one, is very unpopular. So uh, regular. Uh, standing forces have been uh, sort of swapped out with mercenaries from groups like Wagner uh, in order to paint a rosier picture about the, the nature of casualties in the theater. And also, let's remember, this coming weekend, right, six days from now, Putin is going to get reelected, right? I mean, if there's an election, Putin's going to get reelected, right? I'm sorry to spoil it for everybody. Um, but the reality is that in the run-up to this election, the Russian government has been very, very circumspect about major military commitments that could really tilt uh, sort of a popular opinion in Russia away, and which is why they are relying on this sort of hybrid warfare, hybrid warfare in Ukraine with the Little Green Men, and increasingly taking a backseat to Iranian ground operations uh, in places like Syria, right? They're present, but they're not as committed as you would imagine they would be. Real quick before I get to you, it's just interesting that, that Russia has complained about this Iranian proxy force on the ground saying that it's not effective. When there are so many opportunities for the, for the U.S. strategy to exploit these schisms between the Iranian Air Force, or the correction, the Russian Air Force, and what's the proxy force on the ground. Uh, but what's also interesting is how constrained Russia has been. Uh, again, when Turkey started bombing YPG forces and offering that Russia and Iran were working with, Russia did nothing about it. Uh, when we bombed this, this this, these, this gun for hire group, the, what are they called? Wagner. Wagner group. The Russia did nothing about it. And, and again, if you look at when, when Turkish forces moved in on Afrin, they were escorted by uh, the former Jabhat al-Nusra, now Fatah al-Sham, into these areas, uh, p bypassing ISIS enclaves in order to go into Afrin to fight a YPG force. And Assad moved, to, tell me if I got this right, Assad moved, Assad moved Iranian proxies in. Iraqi Shia militias, Hezbollah forces, into Afrin, and Russia did nothing as, as Turkey started bombing these entities and forced them out. It's how interesting this dynamic he here. Yeah, this is what I would want to say, that yes. Russia and Syria has moved from superpower to broker power. No one in Syria can do anything by itself. Iran cannot do anything by itself. Assad, Russia, United States, France, you name it. They need always three, to, three parties to work together to achieve something. Uh, so Russia created the uh, Astana process, then the right. Sushi process, because themselves they cannot impose anything. They cannot find the solution that you are talking about, or they dream to have Syrian uh, solution in the Russian made. This number one. Number two, which is more important, that what we are watching, that is not anymore Syrian-Syrian fight. For the last five years, six years, it was small groups of Syrian fighting other groups in Syria and so on and so forth. Today we are reaching to that countries are fighting each other, as you mentioned, that Turkey attack Assad forces and the United States attack the Russian, and now God knows what will happen in the South. They're all Maybe. proxy ground forces. There's, there's no more forces. There's always that one degree of separation. Those aren't I, really our guys. not exist anymore the right. way it used to be last year, let's say. Right, right. So now expecting that Iranian-Israeli attack or clashes, which already happened, what we see is there's no more proxies. The proxies are diminishing. It's become much more countries that have a sphere of influence, and they are protecting it by whatever forces on the ground, but the Air Force. And that keeps the space of what Jennifer was saying, that this will give the jihadists to say, let's do uh, suicide bombers in Russian area. They kill Syrian, but they say we are fighting Russian, or in regime area, or their own areas. So the space is open for this kind of part two or phase two of the war. And I don't see it how it how it ends without having some kind of all the players they should sit on the table, agree on something, whatever it is something they agree on it, ceasefire, and we can go forward our life. 
my my point is just that if you look at when we hit this russian proxy for us we didn't hit the russians we had a proxy for us but they are russian no no i know but there's a there's a they're not they're not uniform they're not uniform they're you got to hear me out yeah i see i see you got to hear me out all right so the russians hit a proxy for us the turks hit a proxy for us we're not we're not hitting each other because that that would be the line you just can't cross so so yeah nato nato power hitting a us a nato ally hitting a us temporary ally on the ground that's that's where it stays you hit the proxy you can't hit us special forces you can't hit any of our guys we don't hit russian air bases when we hit assad after a chemical attack last year we hit there's always these 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 lines you just stay away from yeah, but this might have said this line is becoming thinner and thinner as yes, every yes. day. Yes, 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 they are. But it's, you were also seeing people sit on their hands, like you said. Nothing happens in in Syria without working with somebody else. Right. But Russia has decided to sit on their hands when it comes to offering. Russia has decided to sit on their hands when it comes to what we did to their product. So, what I'm saying here is that these lines get thinner and thinner. We can actually call players out. We're actually seeing where the Russian rhetoric stops. based on what they're willing to do and what they're not willing to do. Again, we hit do. we've hit Iranian proxies. Israel hit Hezbollah entities in Syria. We hit Iraqi Shia militias in Syria without the repercussions that Iran talks about. What they'll do if these things happen. So I'm just saying we've tested the resolve, Russian resolve, Iranian resolve and and they've tested ours. Yeah, before it was the Syrian fighting Syrian, and each part of Syria is supported by country. Today we finished that phase. Now we are talking about uh, militia like Hezbollah supported by Iran fighting uh, Kurds who are supported by the United States. It's not any more Syrian war. This what I mean. It's become right. very clearly countries fighting each others, and they are very close to have direct confrontation with each others. Right. So this occurred the other phase we have to talk about. about our friend you talk much you are talking a friend every time so let's talk about our friend a little bit a friend was very interesting how the syrian arabs react to our friend from one hand if you follow the the syrian who have large followers on the twitter or facebook so i assume that they are uh, steering the public opinion because they have large followers so they had two two different things about our friend number one they feel is afrin is like gota people being killed at no media uh they have the sympathy with the kurds there's no no question about it big time at the same time they are blaming the sdf pkk pyd whatever you call them that because of your arrogance because you reject the arabs because you want you have your own state within syrian state you hijack the revolution you you did ethnic cleanings in the jazira area and so on and so forth you deserve what you have and here if i want to go deep a little bit i will blame the counter isis coalition to to give the kurds the feeling that you can do anything you want you you defeat isis there's no doubt you sacrifice there's no doubt and so on but they give them the feeling you are you have the upper hand to do whatever you want to do and that's where they stuck here so uh, lesson should be learned Uh, the Kurds they have that uh, problem with the Iraqi Saddam Hussein they have with Russia in Iran they have the first state Kurdish state was in Iran 1945 and uh, I will always advise to our friends the Kurdish friend that the only people who can protect you protect your project protect your identity is your neighbors the Arabs Syrian Arabs it's not United States no matter how long United States will stay you are living Turkey will stay we as an arab we will stay so the more we have good relation the more you will be safe and will be safe yeah it's interesting that that the iraqi kurds believe they had built up enough capital with the us to be able to do the things you're talking about we've helped you do this we've helped you do that now it's now it's your turn to help us and again we promised that we would but as we work with the ypg forces again there's seven seven different groups of kurds and and a lot of times in this city we just say peshmerga and we think we got everybody and in Syria these temporary alliances with the YPG we have a policy east of the Euphrates and we have a policy west of the Euphrates but when you have such a recent example of betrayal and the Kurds will say this the KDP Kurds specifically will say that the US betrayed them with the with the referendum and basically allowing uh 
Iraqi security forces and the Hashid al-Shabi to do things there. And as we work with the YPG, we, we should not be surprised that they're going to start leveraging their positions with other players, with Russia, with Iran, with the Assad regime, because the U.S., we're just, I don't know what our strategy is. I know we had to defeat ISIS strategy, and we limited it to that. And, and I'll talk to you, I want to ask you about this, this, this force that we're building uh, near Al-Tanaf and, and what we're trying to do there, because it sounds like the right thing to finally do uh, and that is to build a Sunni Arab hold force that can actually hold territory once it's cleared of ISIS. And that's been our problem in Iraq and in Syria. We keep using effective fighting forces like the YPG, but they're the, they're the wrong clear and hold forces because if you're rejected by the majority Sunni Arab population in Deir Zor and Raqqa, or what you're doing is viewed as political, then you're not the right force. You're especially not the right force if you're holding territory against ISIS and now you're moving to Afrin because of what's happening there. So I want to ask you about that in a little while, but I wanted to get to, get to some of your other comments based on this discussion. Um, you know, what, what are we doing right and what are we doing wrong? Is it too late? And, uh, and what, what do you think we, we should do now? Uh, because again, the Syrian conflict with over 500,000 deaths has so desensitized the West that we don't even care about Eastern Ghouta being attacked. Yep. It's another letter of condemnation from the UN Security Council resolution. And because we, we raised the bar so high, we made sarin gas the threshold for U.S. military action. Uh, that's why Mattis's words are so important, you know, weaponized gas attacks or chemical gas attacks. I mean, where are we now? What can we do? And what are we at risk of losing if the policy doesn't change? And I just ask all three of you to respond. Who'd like to respond first? Sure. sure. <laughs> um, so I, I think it's a good question. Uh, like, a, like a good lawyer, I would sort of reframe the question. Sure. What are we doing? Not right, not wrong. What are we doing? Because from, where, from my vantage point, there is an, uh, sort of a distinct lack of a coherent end state that we're trying to pursue. Right? We're doing tactical things on the ground. We're supporting different groups. But we haven't really articulated a clear vision for Syria. Other parties have, though. Uh, the Iranians have. The Russians have. And so, you know, the old saw is that if you don't stand for something, you fall for anything, right? So what we're seeing now is this incremental movement of the political dialogue in favor of the Russian and Iranian end state, in favor of an internationalized status for parts of Syria that would help, uh, you know, with a, a sort of a, a donor coalition that would help with reconstruction, uh, a, an open-ended Russian and Iranian military presence throughout the totality of the country that would allow them to pursue counterterrorism operations. These are things that, if you sort of think through over the long term, are pretty inimical to American strategic interests and to the interests of our allies. But because we haven't articulated a coherent end state, we haven't objected to these nearly as strenuously as we should. Would it be fair to say that Iran wants to stay, Russia wants to stay, and we want to get out? Correct. It's and and I would, the, the only sort of addition I would say is Iran wants to stay, Russia wants to stay, and it needs Iran to acquiesce to its staying, and we want to get out as quickly as possible. I would offer a slightly different um, interpretation, which is that I do think I, I want to give credit to the administration insofar as they have identified some very sound long-term goals inside of Syria, which included diplomatic resolution of the war. Um, so I do think that there is, in part, a vision there. They want you know, diminished Iranian influence, you know, et cetera. But what is lacking is a coherent strategy to actually achieve those long-term outcomes. And as a result of that absence of a coherent strategy, we're falling for things in the, in the near term and we're being manipulated. And I think one of the largest um, oversights we've actually made, one of the largest gaps in our strategy is a recognition that a negotiated settlement of the war requires Syrians at the table, as Bassam stated, but it requires the existence of an opposition delegation to negotiations with Assad that is actually willing to negotiate and willing to make concessions. Assad, the Russians, and the Iranians are killing anybody willing to come to the table as fast as they possibly can. The US has no strategy actually to preserve and to protect the groups that are willing to negotiate. The next place where these groups are going to die is in Dara in southern Syria, where the Trump administration has agreed to a de-escalation zone agreement with the Russians that the Russians, the regime, and the Iranians are already violating, and we seem to be just ignoring that. Um, and we will see the military campaign, I expect, move to southern Syria next, after 
the fall of Eastern Ghouta. The U.S. has a vital stake, actually, in ensuring that those opposition groups do not be defeated. Because if they are, what will happen is that the Syrian revolution, which called for democracy and negotiations with Assad, will be replaced by the jihad, which is al-Qaeda's goal. Al-Qaeda and other groups like ISIS and other jihadist groups inside of Syria want the moderate opposition groups willing to negotiate to be slaughtered, actually, on the battlefield. They will support them tactically because the counter-Assad fight is important. But what we will watch inside of Syria is actually the death of any hope of a negotiated settlement of this war, unless the United States and our allies begin actually to take measures to preserve these groups and thereby preserve American leverage at the negotiating table as well. So I will continue where she starts, American leverage. Um, from my experience with the, uh, the American officials who were dealing in Syria for the last two, three years, the major thing they always say, um, I have always to convince them that the United States is superpower. And they, they refuse to admit that the United States is superpower. And we always try to tell them, you are the superpower. There's, 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 no, there's no one equal to you. Right? Uh, they're talking points. We have no leverage in Syria. We are losing. We have to work with Russia. We have to trust Russia. So they give all the cards in their dealing with the, any international negotiation without starting anything. And they, I remember many Syrian delegation, they came to DC and they told them, why are you coming here? Go to Moscow. Uh, and it's official, it's official meetings. And it's not like off the records. Oh, what are you are doing here? Go to Moscow. And when they go to Moscow, they thought, why are coming here? Go to Assad. Um, I think I don't think United, United States needs to think about their strategy. I think they need to think about themselves, uh, what they want. This is the starting point. Are they are they superpower or not? Does this part of the world have interest for United States national interest or not? And based on that, they have to communicate with the with the, with the world what they want. Is uh, Iran threat for United States? How threat is it? 50%, 90%, they have to act accordingly. They cannot make statements here and do different policy there. It's, it's, it's fire back on the United States itself. Uh, the Syrian, again, when they went to the street, they went for dignity. They didn't want for the war. Nobody asked the war. Nobody was expecting the war. Actually, the, the Egyptian friends, they bluffing us. When they went to Tahrir, they have music, and we thought it would be the same thing. We go a couple of weeks to the main square with some music, and and Assad will go. And <laughs> we always blame them that where you guys, you left us. <laughs> you throw us under the bus and you left. Uh, so I think there should be their own revision about themselves as an American administration. So we, we see Trump when he came with his big voice about Iran. We know uh, the weakest point or strongest point in Syria is Iran. It depends how you look into it. Uh, Russia doesn't need Iran to stay. United States doesn't need Iran to to stay or both of them, they don't agree that Iran should take bigger than its shape. So that was something positive in looking how the administration would act. In reality, as I mentioned, the last year, it's everything was worse than during Obama's time. And the Dara'a, the escalating zone, the Jordanian and the Israeli, they asked the American that we need the, the escalating zone to be something like 40 kilometers. And the American gave five. They agree with the Russian to ask five. And we ask them, why you ask five? They say, we trust the Russian. Uh, why you trust the Russian? They say they cannot do anything without us. And uh, the argument was, what if you're wrong? You say, okay, you lost Syria. I said, okay, good. I mean, that's that kind of argument we had with, uh, with senior level of the administration. I don't think the United States, you have the most talented people in the world. You have the highest, best think tanks, people, education. No one can compete the United States. It's about literally figure out what you want. Uh, if they don't figure out, I think we just get lost. To your point, you, you, you were kind of asking the U.S. to look forward, look forward to what the next area of focus is going to be for Iran and Assad. And, and, as, as, and, you, and you mentioned Dara, but we're not even addressing what's behind us, what's happened in Afrin, what's happened in East Ghouta. So what should the U.S. top three priorities be in order to, to do something now at the tactical, operational, and strategic level to do what Bassem says, act as a superpower. Stop, stop allowing Russia and Iran to dictate what we can and can't do. And, and, and in that same context, uh, having Turkey stop telling us what to do in Syria also. So what would your top three recommendations be? And I'll ask each panelist. 
Sure. So the first uh, that I would recommend is that we start preparing now actually to block that offensive into Dara province, into southern Syria. We know that it takes time in advance actually to put into place the kinds of policies and then implement those kind of policies. So I, I do think we need to start now. Um, we also should be considering options in southern Syria to clear out the ISIS pocket that is on the Golan Heights and, and to at least constrain the freedom of operation and combat power that al-Qaeda linked groups have in southern Syria. So that's one. I think a second priority should actually be a change in our plan to stabilize areas we have recaptured from ISIS in northeastern Syria. The U.S. has put very few actually actual constraints on the behavior of the Syrian Democratic Forces, which is accused by local communities of corruption and abuse of power and arbitrary detentions, which are linked in many respects to the YPG's uh, intent to dominate the political environment in northeastern Syria, but also just reflect an, a lack, in my view, of adequate U.S. attention to the behavior of our local partner. I think we should be doing things like bringing in human rights monitors to inspect prisons in YPG-held areas and, and to, again, to constrain some of the damaging behavior that the Syrian Democratic Forces is accused of, which will actually cause the kinds of local resentment that can fuel a post-ISIS insurgency, even if it's not ISIS. Because Al-Qaeda and other jihadist groups will actually resurge in eastern Syria if they have the space within these communities to do so. So that's the second. And then I do think the third needs to be a high priority on de-escalating with Turkey. Um, I think the second objective that I outlined could help us make progress in negotiations with Erdogan, who continues to say that he doesn't want American promises. He wants actual observable change in U.S. policy inside of Syria. So I do think that the, the Afrin operation is so far underway that it may no longer be possible actually to halt the, that offensive or you know, to constrain the scale of that fighting. We're already so far deep in that. Um, we certainly should try, however, to prevent the most likely and most dangerous follow-on operations that Erdogan may be considering and that, frankly, the YPG may be considering. Because the YPG actually a few weeks ago claimed to conduct an attack inside of Turkey. Uh, which is a very dangerous bellwether, actually, for the kinds of escalation we could see in the future if the fighting in Afrin doesn't stop, and then, of course, if it expands beyond there. Because Erdogan has continued to restate his willingness to consider using military force against Manbij. Um, right. And he even, to get to Bassam's point about the thinning lines between escalation patterns, Erdogan has also been saying things like, well, if American troops are still wearing YPG patches, right. perhaps we will, in fact, consider them as terrorists and we would be willing to use force. So right. I, I definitely think that that's a concern. And he's also talked about going to, to the Iraqi border. Right. And I'd ask you a fourth recommendation, because we did, you didn't talk about IRGC Quds Force militias or any of the Iranian militias that are operating also in the South that are posing a threat in the South. So can you, can you talk about them for a second? Sure. I, I do, as I mentioned earlier, think the U.S. needs a practical strategy against Iran. But I would submit that in the near term, what, we, what the United States actually does need to do is consolidate our gains, acquire some leverage, and set conditions so that we can confront Iran without exposing U.S. troops, but U.S. interests in Syria to undue risk. We're simply not postured for a confrontation with Iranian proxies right now. We're too vulnerable. <clears throat> I think we need to actually shore up our position apply some constraints on Iran, and then consider what the follow-on operations should be. We're outnumbered 10 to 1 in Iraq in our advisory role with the Iraqi security forces. Now that the RGC goods forces have been brought into the MOD and the MOI in Iraq, we're outnumbered 20 to 1. Um, and in Syria, again, with a force of about 2,000, mm -hmm. 3,000 U.S. forces, I was, I, we were in Iraq with 160,000. And we had a hard time inspecting prisons and making sure the Iraqi security forces weren't conducting human rights abuses uh, while also targeting al-Qaeda and Shia militias and trying to stabilize a country while allowing political accommodation. How do you do that in Syria with 2,000 U.S. forces that are primarily at a base based on the Fitbit uh, <laughs> Stravos map that showed where they were? Um, how, do you, how do you do those things? I, and I'm not asking you to solve all the problems uh, in Syria or Iraq, but it's very difficult. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do all the right things. And how do we get there? So I'll come back to you on that. Sure. And you want to say that? Uh, well, I, I had my three, you know. I'm yeah, yeah, your three. Give me three. And then you feel free to add a four as long as you talk about Iran. No, so so I, I will, I will. So Iran, Iran is one of them. I, I would start actually with assurance. Um, so the sort of the reason we, we need to understand this is, is because the balance of power in southern Syria, as Jennifer said, is shifting. Um, Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel, has been to Russia three, uh, five times. Five times, I think, is the count. 
Um, and every single time during the course of the Syrian civil war, he's essentially asked the Kremlin for the same thing. He said, build me a moat, right? Uh, build me a fire line so that instability from the Syrian conflict doesn't extend southward. Now we're seeing that condominium begin to break apart, right? We're seeing for the first time sort of cross-border escalation in a way that's really dangerous uh, to the security of Israel, and it's also dangerous in terms of escalation, potentially, in the Syrian space. So the first order of business, as we begin to shape our Syria strategy, is assurance. How do we reassure our allies? How do we make sure, how do we sort of clamp down on escalation by reassuring the Israelis that there aren't going to be more violations, right? Uh, That may be military deployments, that may be conversations with the Russians, that may be uh, sort of a more forceful pushback on the Iranians, right? Which is the second point. Um, And I think Jennifer's exactly right. The only thing I would add with regard to the uh, Iranian uh, irregulars uh, and the RGC is that for all all intents and purposes, the the cohort that we're talking about is actually much larger than we understand. The Israelis estimate that the secondary expeditionary force that the Iranians have amassed from uh, Afghan Shiites, from Pakistani Shiites, from Yemenis, is something on the order of 82,000 fighters. Right, which is twice the size of the entire foreign fighter contingent that has joined the Islamic State. And the difference is that while the foreign fighters that have joined Daesh are self-organized, right, and they sort of dissipate and they create all sorts of problems, these are not. These are centrally controlled. Right. And so what we need to be thinking about is, as we begin to think about our Iran strategy, is where these guys are going next or where they might be deployed next. Uh, and that's, I think, a huge component of putting Iran back in the box. And the third sort of recommendation I would give is to ratchet up the costs for participants. So at least from the Russian perspective, they want two things right now in Syria. They want to stay, and they want to get somebody else to pay for it. Right? They want reconstruction to be handled by this international donor coalition. They want to sort of have freedom of movement around the country. But they really don't want to shoulder any of the economic burdens, because it's expensive. So from our perspective, If we're interested in looking at Syria beyond the conflict, if we're looking at sort of post-conflict reconstruction, we need to get concrete commitments. We need to have people put their money where their mouth is to make sure that this sort of reconstruction doesn't become an American venture the way it did in Iraq. Right. And I answer yeah, of course, that of course. questions from Syrian perspective again. Uh-huh. Uh, they are international, uh, very local. <laughs> Iran doesn't have legitimacy in Syria. Syria mainly Sunni state, uh, Iran and our Shiad. Unfortunately, the Shiites who are coming to Syria, they have deep ideological Shiites. They are, they see us as an enemy. We don't have, uh, for quite a long time, we didn't have any problem or any differences or any differentiation between Sunni and Shia till Iranian and uh, revolution started to, to express the idea that we are a Shia. So Iranian power in Syria, it's a problem for the Iranian more than the Sunnis because we are the majority, they are the minorities. Uh, when the United States want to think about allies on the ground, they, beside all the regional power, they have natural allies on the Syrian themselves against Iran. Iran, anywhere they want to go, the first thing they have to do is ethnic clinics. They kick all the Sunni out. They cannot live with them because they know that they will fight back. So when we talk about the south, we talk about the Jazeera, we talk about Euphrates areas, you talk about any area that Iranian is there, the first thing we should look about, where are the Sunnis? Where are they? And we find most of the Sunnis are either IDPs or refugees, wars. So I will come to the recommendation. And we see the UN is coming by the US money, the EU money, to rebuild and stabilize the areas which is cleaned by the Sunnis Arab and brought uh, Shiat. So the UN is helping demographic change in Syria with the, all the goodwill they claim to be. And that's disaster. So as a recommendation, the US, EU, they should monitor what the UN is doing in Syria, where they are spending the money. Are they spending the money in the right place to the needed people, or they are supporting Iranian, Russian regime plan? When we talk about United States tools, what they have tools, besides the Syrian who are natural allies and they don't want to see them, you have so many bills at the Congress that to say that US should not invest in any organization that they are building in the area where Iran uh, exists in Syria. So, so the key word we, we should use again and again is the money. Uh, we try as a Syrian community, Syrian American community, to convince the Congress to, to sanction the, the Shia, the Iraqi Shia militia in Syria, Assad, Ahl al-Haq, and, and right. others. And the Congress was very much with us. They accept the idea. The administration said, we cannot do it, because we have forces in Iraq. And if we designate these people as terrorists, they kill our forces in Iraq. So US become the weak 
position toward militia, which is we back to the question, are you superpower or not? Who dares to touch the American soldiers? They, they would pay a huge price, much bigger than they can live with. Uh, we have so many tools with the Syrian to counter Iran, counter Russia. For We back to the Jazeera area, Euphrates shields, where you have 2,000 Americans. We always call the Americans, we don't need your soldiers to go to Syria. We don't need you. Stay in your home, whatever you want. Don't come to Syria because empowering Syria is enough to, to, to win. And we talk about the Jazeera area is controlled by the Kurds. Till today, we have 2,000 American soldiers on the ground. And till today, SDF is selling the products to the regime. The products, daily products, the gas, the oil, agricultural products. They give it from the area under U.S. control back to the regime area, and they get the money. And the U.S., they are thinking at the Treasury where which bank the regime is using to. So we have to sanction. Mm -hmm. uh, they follow $1 million, and they close eye, their eyes for $100 million. So many small tools doesn't need to change the whole big policy or big strategy. Just look deep what's going on around you, and you can make big change. Well, what's interesting about what you're saying, and we looked at this map earlier, so if you look at the map and you can see the Euphrates River, that's where, that's what you're talking about. That's yeah. where Iran is starting to push in Shia from different countries, not only Iraqi Shia, but Shia from Afghanistan. It's this resettlement process, this forced gentrification of an area, this demographic shift, something they did in Baghdad, something they're trying to do in northern Diyala, something they're doing any time a, 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 an Iranian proxy force clears an area, this is this is the template. This is a strategy. This is the trend. They yeah. know it. Uh, I just came back from the Iraq Reconstruction Conference in Kuwait, meaning a couple weeks ago, and what you're talking about wasn't in place there. There's no conditions on where the money, how the money is spent, and it's not a conditions-based donor community. It's 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 leaving a lot of private investors hesitant to enter into Iraq, uh, based on what the IMF and the World Bank are saying about doing business in Iraq's econ economic sectors, because of where the IRGC is playing. But you have that in Syria, and again, as we talk about reconstruction, you talk about the complete destruction of of cities to exit Sunni Arabs from them, and then to repopulate. But to have international community money go in and rebuild places only to have those places not be available to refugees coming back, Sunni refugees from Turkey and the indi individually displaced Sunnis that are, are in Syria. Um, how, how well is that known to, to Congress? How well is that known to our decision makers that, that these things should be conditional? Again, it's not just being a superpower as a military power, but a superpower using your economic leverage and your economic tools at Treasury and other places to force these conditions Again, the IMF is, is being braver than the U or more brave than the U.S. is being in a lot of cases, and so is so is the World Bank, because again, where money goes, where where people actually the whole invest. issue is the money today. Um, I fully agree with you that in their zone, the areas there is the southern of the river is still under control of Assad slash the the Iranian forces, the pro-Iranian militia. The northern part is the Kurdish area, Syrian or Kurdish area. So today we are seeing uh, a lot of Shiite, Iraqi, and Afghani, they are coming to take the houses of the Arabs who left. Uh, and they get the money from Iran, the house is there, the agricultural land, is. this area is rich, it's agricultural land, and they come and sit. And the regime, legally, they give them the authorization to stay and residency, and some say they give them nationality. And that's why Assad, one time, he said, not far away, three weeks, four weeks ago, that the population of Syria is 28 million. Does it make sense? Because 2011, we were uh, 22 million. Seven million, officially, they are out. And Assad said, oh, in Syria, we have 28 million. So the question, he's not joking. Uh, maybe they are giving the nationality for these foreigners to come and hold. Uh, the, the Iranian, they always go with the money, the easy money they build, they, uh, they give uh, subsidies for a lot of things. And the, the most important trend in Syria that any time the regime make any reconciliation with the areas, the people of the area flee. They don't stay. They don't trust the regime. So anytime we hear, we heard all the Syria, it happens so many hundred times. Anytime the regime make reconciliation, the first thing the people leave. They don't trust the regime. They rape their wives. They take the people for the army. They, they confiscate everything, and nobody talks. That's it's done. 
So uh, that's give the space for Iranian militia, for the Shia, for the families to come and stay. Uh, the problem we become with the UN, with the World Bank, they put plans to rebuild Syria, $3 million. They called early recovery, and we asked them where this money would go. They said it goes for infrastructure. And who will run the infrastructure, say, the regime, because we don't work except with the regime. And they are in D.C., and just the Congress, they are very much supporting us, supporting the Syrian cause to say there should be no U.S. money goes to empower Iran or Russia and Syria. So you can see this two dilemma. Right, right. Uh, the administration, I don't know, they have no voice on that issue much. The White House, they say there's no money should go. When you go down a little bit, they say, you know what, you know, maybe if we can, some money goes here and there. Uh, the Congress is the major player on this, and we hope that they will uh, pass all the bills, reconstruction bills and other bills. What, what you're describing is consolidation of gains with this demographic shift where as, as the Assad regime pushes Shia into Deir ez and Iraq in these areas. And the only thing stopping them is a temporary alliance with the YPG, who are now looking to leverage these, these areas that they've captured and give them back to the regime in order mm -hmm. to retain uh, control of northern northern Syria. So again, it's you know consolidating gains and losses. Uh, the yeah, one, but here the very important thing. I mean, the numbering is always the number. The, the Euphrates areas it has something like the total population is two million. Today, Raqqa, for example, before the war, before in 2011, the population of Raqqa it used to be half million. Today, they are three thousand, and the people are gone. The population of Deir ez-Zor, it used to be 300-something, 300, 300,000-something. Today, we are talking about 20,000, and the people have gone. So the SDF, or the forces, they are taking the lands without population. They don't have to defend it. They, it's easy for them to give it to the regime uh, if they have a good deal for their own right. interest. And that will go against U.S. national interest. Right. At lay down by Tillerson, that this is area where we leverage. The last point, which is very important as well, the Assad always take, always said here at Russia and at Iranian that we control the benefits Syria, and they said the population more than sixty percent of Syria under regime Assad, but the American control the richest Syria. Syria is that part; it has all the oil, all the gas, all the water, all the culture. Holding it would make the other Syria weak; they cannot survive. I would just add a very short note, which is to, to echo off of Bassam's point. I think I'm hopeful that the upcoming change in the State Department um, with, with Pompeo, uh, likely replacing Tillerson, will actually result in a change in the U.S. diplomatic approach. Because what Secretary, Secretary Tillerson had outlined actually was that we are going to back essentially a Russian proposal to hold near-term elections inside of Syria. Right. And I think it's just important to note that it's this strategy of forced displacement and then resettlement of pro-regime populations, that's how Assad wins that election. Um, and I, I don't actually believe that there's any kind of regime of UN inspectors or monitors actually that can avoid the outcome, which will be Assad's reelection, because this strategy of local uh, displacement and resettlement is so highly effective. And, and that is a tactic. Now, we're seeing it in Iraq with May 12th elections. The Sunnis in the refugee camps want them to delay it so they can actually get back to their cities so they can actually vote. So th this is a process. But what's interesting about Syria is we received a Free Syrian Army delegation here and I'm sure you guys received them as well, um, that were basically complaining that they're not able to get back into areas that have been cleared of ISIS because the SDF won't let them back, uh, claiming that it's because of the demining process, the unexploded ordinance. And, and while that is accurate, that there are areas that need to be cleared, it's also a tactic to delay, to delay the return of refugees. And it's something where you see a, a, an ally that we should be working with, the Free Syrian Army, uh, and I basically want to say Sunni Arabs, now working with Turkey, a NATO ally, but to go into Afrin, push out a U.S. temporary ally. It, all these things just, it, they're, they're so interesting, and yet we, we ignore them. Uh, but again, like, like you said, there are so many things we need to address. I mean, we, we've listed 20 problems, and I've only asked each of you for three solutions. And, and it's, it's very difficult, especially with this, this force on the ground. But maybe, maybe it is that diplomatic uh, leverage that maybe Pompeo will bring into state, where we don't take a backseat to, to Russia, Iran, and, and, and Turkey, in, in the case of Syria. Um, I do want to thank, uh, I'm not thinking my panel yet, I want to thank ISW for letting us use your map. 
Institute for the Study of War. It should be about 10 times more complicated than that, of course, <laughs> because like the four colors is, is right, about as simple right. as I can make it. But No, but it's good. And, and it, you've done some great work laying out the Iranian militias, what Iran is doing there, and some great work on what they're doing in Iraq also. And, and again, what's interesting about, you know, I'm an Iraq guy mainly, but ISIS saw Iraq and Syria as the same battlefield. Iran sees Iraq and Syria as the same battlefield. Russia hasn't looked at it as the same battlefield. Turkey sees it as the same battlefield in a lot of ways. The U.S. sees it in this compartmentalized way where it's Baghdad. Then, well, the Kurds, yeah, you guys, you guys did this. So there, there's a narrative out there that, um, and we saw this in a Wall Street Journal article yesterday by, uh, by a gentleman who puts out these narratives that's close to the Dawa political party stating that, well, the, the Sunnis and the Kurds deserve what happened to them. And again, it's, it's about reconstruction money going to the Sunni areas of Iraq, and we're going to see the same argument in Syria. Why is the international community spending all this money in areas where the Sunnis welcomed in Daesh and the Kurds went against the central government? And why are we not spending that money to honor the sacrifice and the martyrs of the, the majority Shia population in Iraq or the minority Shia Alawite population in, in Syria? So the narratives are already out there. So not only are you looking at what we can do militarily, what we need to do diplomatically, but we'll, how we have to counter these narratives in real time. And I would argue that Assad, Putin, or let's just say Damascus, Moscow, and Tehran, are, they're all smiling right now. Time. And uh, how do we get that smile to go away real quick? Start with you. <laughs> sure, I think, yeah, so I, I, I would agree with that framing. I do, I do agree strongly with Bassam that the U.S. is acting like we have less ability to affect things in Syria than we actually do. Um, part of that is because we have decided we want to do it on the cheap because we don't want to expend a lot of resources in this theater, in part because if Central Command is going to do one thing this year, that thing is Afghanistan. And, of course, we're concerned about um, the potential for war with North Korea and the requirements therein for an acceptable military posture um, to achieve that deterrence. So I understand the constraints that the U.S. does face in choosing our strategy inside of Syria and Iraq, but I think one of the things that has been most dangerous is this U.S. tendency to simultaneously define really big goals, like negotiated end to the war, um, without actually resourcing those goals, but then to do one thing at a time. And I think one, one of the reasons why the Russians and the Iranians and Assad are running circles around us is because we focused only on an anti-ISIS strategy, as you mentioned earlier, and we didn't prepare for what comes after ISIS. Right. We didn't prepare militarily, economically, diplomatically. We didn't. So we arrived at the end of anti-ISIS operations, and we found that everybody else, including the Turks, were already ready for the wars after ISIS. Right, right, and we after. are still playing catch up. And you still see the narrative out of the Defense Department saying, we call on all sides in Syria to remain focused on the anti-ISIS fight. Right. And I mean, at this point in the war, that's just laughable. Right. So, so Bassam, you have Pompeo, H.R. McMaster, and Mattis right in front of you. What would you say? No, I, I would say that the United States, they want a cheap involvement in Syria. And they already, they spent $25 billion on Syria between military and humanitarian. And we always tell them, if you give this money to Assad and his loyalists, from day one, we don't have the war. They will be happy with this money, and everybody will be happy. To go forward, uh, even though Russia, Iran, Damascus are smiling, but really worried from the United States. They always worried from the United States. They don't know what the United States can do, because they know the United States can flip the table at any time. And there's so many people at the DOD, they always say that we can flip all the table within 72 hours. We are capable to do this, but we don't have the will or the interest or day after or so on and so forth. Um, again, I, I, any suggestion would be very much hypothetical, suggesting that I will, I will not go to it, rather than I will just ask the new administration, are you, do you have the will or not? If you don't have the will, don't make statements. Keep us safe. We, we lost a lot. So, so we often say, you know, you know yep. look at the problem through your eyes. And uh, you don't have anything to tell them? You got three guys right in front of you. <laughs> HR McMaster, Pump. I, I, I tell you, I tell you, but I mean, we have a lot of bad stories, so I don't want to have too much high expectation. When 
Arab Minister of Foreign Affairs, I will not mention his name, he used to say in the summer two, two years ago that we will take Assad by force and we will go send our forces by force, by force, by force. And the Assad respond every day to send his forces to kill the people. Challenging. So one is making a tough statement that we will go by force to, to take you out. And Assad was literally sending his forces every day to, to say, come and kill me, I'm killing the real people. Tell the people on the ground, they tell that minister, please stop doing, stop statements, because we are paying the price. Right. So today we have a new administration or a new group of people who are handling the Syria. Uh, the focus is Iran, number one, and Iran is still weak in Syria, and we can flip the tables with very minimum tools. Just trust the Syrian, empower them, use what you have in Euphrates areas, use what you have from vetted Syrian army still exist, few numbers here and there. Uh, believe in yourself as superpower, empower your neighbors. Uh, they are loser. They are winner because United States is out, but they are loser. Uh, just one thing real quick. So you mentioned, you mentioned uh, the place, uh, what was the name of that city, Rukhan? Rukban. Rukban, yes, I wrote it down back there. I thought I had it here. All right, Rukban is, is a great example based on what we talked about what we should be doing. Of course, we're doing it late. We mentioned the, the Sunni Arab force that was being built at Al Tanaf that is now moving closer to Deir Azor to, to be the right hold force. A Sunni Arab force familiar with the area. And you mentioned the 200,000 Sunni Arabs that are at the IDP camp right, right, right there. Right. And how they are the next crop that will go into this training uh, scenario. Now, th this is different from the training that General Nagata did. No, 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 it's completely different. It has nothing to do with this. In a good way. Because when General Nagata was, was told to train this force, he was said, they can only fight ISIS. They can't fight anybody right. else. They can only fight ISIS. This force is much different. This is the right force, the whole territory, uh, that will actually uh, secure the areas that we've cleared of ISIS. Look, when, when the, the war against ISIS in Deir Zor started, the coalition started to, to, to push back, or when they were preparing to push back ISIS from Deir Zor. So all these forces, they are uh, U.S. vetted, you are sponsored, and even the base was U.S., so they trust them that they put them in their own base. They approached the Americans to say, guys, this is our land. We can help you to liberate it. We, we can take care of it, and so on and so forth. They offer everything. Uh, the guy in charge of counter ISIS answered them that out of 1,500, we will take only 100, and they should sign a letter or paper. That only fight ISIS. Only f don't fight SDF, only yeah. fight ISIS. And when after liberation, you should don't have any political ambitions. That means you don't control that areas. And the Syrians say, what is this? I mean, this is a joke. And they refuse to join. Right. Today, with, the co with this development that SDF are is withdrawing from the areas, and they say to the regime, come and take it. So the, the US, uh, hopefully, they are in the process to revisit that offer again to get these people who are the, the locals to bring them back to their own areas to fill the gaps at the vacuum that SDF has uh, lifted. And there's a Rukban camp with something like 200,000 people. Very few people, very few media talks about that Rukban. Again, 200,000, they are in the desert, literally in the desert. I, I can show you the pictures. There's nothing, not even tent. Um, from, from the locals area, and I think the American now, they are revisiting the idea that why don't we use them to fill that gap. Um, if they used them long time ago, I don't think ISIS mm. can survive. It's what we did in Iraq with the surge. We, we picked five Sunni tribal leaders. They built a force of 100,000 within 90 days. Then they were vetted by Americans through biometrics and other things. But th this force that you talk about, it was, like you said, it went, it went down from 5,000 down to 100. Only 40 got trained. They got sent to the battlefield had all their equipment taken away and killed. So this is a much better process. It's seven years too late, but it's it's the way you do it. You it's have never to too late, because as, if you don't use the locals, you always lose. Seven years behind. Maybe oh, not too no, late, sorry. seven years behind, yeah. but you have to build a Sunni Arab force. Um, you want to say anything else? Not, well, I mean, if I did have that August audience, I, what I would actually argue, and, and I, I think, unfortunately, uh, what Jennifer Mubassam said has, is sort of confirms this, we are this far into the Syrian civil war, we actually need a build. We need a build phase in terms of figuring out what we want our Syrian strategy to look like. 
and the start of that build phase. And again, right, not, not to say that there haven't been attitudes expressed about objectives, but what we're lacking is that overarching umbrella that tells us what we want to achieve, who our partners are, and who our adversaries are. Um, just a couple of sort of guidelines for as we think about this. Is first of all, we need to get much smarter on the actors in Syria. Uh, the sort of the, the distinctions between the different Kurdish groups, what their objectives are, who can be our ally, who can't be our ally. For example, what the Russians want as an end state, what the Iranians want, is this compatible with what we want? The second question, and this is, uh, we didn't really talk about it, um, but uh, it's, it's something that we really can't avoid for that much longer, is in our camp of allies, who our true allies are. And this is really a conversation about Turkey. Uh, you know, what we're seeing is uh, we're seeing a, a Turkish government that's pursuing an increasingly adversarial line that is at variance with NATO policy. Uh, and, you know, there's all sorts of implications for alliance cohesion and also for escalation or de-escalation in the Syrian space. But, you know, we're sort of turning a blind eye to it because we don't really know what to do with it. But we have to have that conversation. And I would argue that not just in the Syrian space, but in the larger question of alliance solidarity moving forward, Alliances move along only at the pace of their most grudging member. So when you have a Turkey that's not doing the things that uh, the Europeans and the Americans want them to do, we have a structural problem that we need to at least have the courage to talk about openly. And the third is that you know the sort of the the great American uh, philosopher Eric Hoffer said, you know, ideological movements are inherently competitive. So as we begin to sort through who the players are. Uh, in the Syrian space, we have to remember that if you're a Syrian nationalist, you're not an Islamist. And if you're an Islamist, you're not a Syrian nationalist. Okay. Right? And we should be able to rack and stack who our allies are and who our adversaries are based upon that very simple metric. And I'm frankly flabbergasted that we haven't done so so far. Right. If I could add just one closing thought, I think what I would stress is that the United States does need to pivot towards implementing a counter-Iran strategy inside of Syria. But we need to do so without falling into the same trap that we fell into in, I in our anti-ISIS strategy, which was to do only that, um, and to do it with a fixation on tactical gains without actually building the structures and the alliances that would actually ensure that those gains endure in the long term. And it is my view, actually, that countering Iran and countering jihadist groups are in many ways the same thing. Same thing. We need to build the kinds of local structures that have legitimacy, that are willing to negotiate, that are acceptable American partners, which are inherently forces for good against the kinds of Iranian encroachment and jihadist encroachment that the United States currently faces. So we continue to, to refuse to do the one thing, actually, that solves multiple problems simultaneously. The Sunni Arab nationalist on both sides of the border. Bassem, I want to give you the last, uh, the last couple minutes to Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I think this goes 10 minutes if somebody will ask. Is that? It's no, no, I got that part. You go you got that 10 part. minutes, and then I'll, I'll get that part. <laughs> I, I still believe that the Syrian people, uh, the Syrian or the Arab in the Middle East, they are really allies for the United States. Uh, from Morocco to Syria, even to Iran, and if the United States, when they decide to open the borders for the people to come to here without a visa, you see it, all the people will come here regardless of what you hear or what they hear about the United States. So United States is, is the place where the people look into it. Uh, look, in, what the Syrian refugees, they went to Europe. Nobody goes to Iran or to Russia. We don't need visa to Iran, by the way. The people can't fly without visa. Uh, and the ticket is $100. They prefer to go take the risk on the sea and go to Europe. That indicates how much this ugly system. They cannot add value to the society or to our daily life, Russian or the Iranian. And people look about the United States, about the West, as the alternative or the dream or the ideal things. And it's quite clear that you failed them big time. Still, I don't believe that it's too late. It's always time is there, all those people looking to that state to act. Uh, the first thing I think the United States should act is just to stop the killing. Simply stop the killing. And they are capable to stop the killing, daily killing, before we go to second step or third or fourth. Stop the killing by itself will show the world the United States is capable. And it's back to the norms and the values that people look into in the United States. Uh, Russia, Iran, they are failing, no matter what they will do in Syria. They cannot stay in Syria. They cannot stay in Lebanon. They are rejected. They are being there by force. Whereas the United States, we are asking you to come and you don't want to come. I mean, this is the, this is the things that we always should think about it. As you say, the allies. 
you have natural allies and you are just kicking them out. And the other people, they came by force to say, we are your allies, the Russian or the Iranian or Hezbollah or the other militias. Literally, they have no values. Either if they have one small value, people will follow. They will like what they have. Nothing. Thank you. Thank you. So, so we started about five minutes late, so we're going to go to 135, and we'll take questions now. I'd ask you to identify yourselves, stand up, wait for the mic to get to you, and, and limit this to a question instead of a, a statement, if you, if you would, because I'll, I'll rush you on that. If you're starting to make a statement, I'm going to ask you to ask the question. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Alex Sanchez. I'm a defense analyst here in D.C. Next week, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia is coming, to, is coming here. He's probably going to meet with people in Capitol Hill and President Trump as well. Do you think that Syria is going to come up? Uh, Saudi Arabia is still very involved in Yemen, but the Crown Prince is trying to assert himself as a big regional player here. He went to Egypt and, Lev and London in the, in the past couple of weeks. Do you think that Syria will be discussed? And if so, what will the Crown Prince suggest or what will the administration suggest the Crown Prince to do when it comes to Saudi Arabian involvement in Syria? Thank you. Okay, well, we heard one question. We're going to ask, uh, get two more, and then we'll have the panel answer. Sir? The two biggest disruptive forces in the area are Iran and Turkey. Uh, recently, as you said, the uh, UN had a resolution to order a ceasefire. Ambassador Haley yesterday said, if the UN can't enforce it, the US will. Is there a way, and, well, and Turkey said since they're fighting terrorists, they don't come under their resolution, the UN said yes, you do. Is there a way to include any US military push to force the ceasefire on Turkey? Both in offering and in East Kutu. Particularly in offering. Okay, uh, other questions? Uh, how many hands do we have? Hilal, and then we'll come to you, sir. Hilal, uh, back there. Uh, Hilal Fracken of the Hudson Institute. Um, I, I, the question I have, or actually it's, it's uh, for, the, for the whole panel, but um, back at the beginning, uh, Michael, you <coughs> raised the question of whether things are just too late. And I take it as the consensus of the panel, but it's not. And in particular, uh, Ms. Uh, Caffarella was uh, stressed what could be done in eastern and southern Syria. Um, I wanted to ask what you think are the, the force requirements for that? I mean, on our side, uh, how, how big a force would be required to carry out what you very admirably described as a Syria strategy? Um, the other question is also for the whole panel, but perhaps Elon <coughs> is more interested in subject is the question of, of Russia. There was an implication that um, somehow the Russians uh, play, uh, uh, are, the, uh, are following Iran in, uh, they, they, they can't call the shots in, in, in Syria. And that seems a little strange to me because up until September 2015, uh, Assad and, and Iranians were losing. So it seems to me that they that action showed that they were the decisive force. Um, in that event, if they are more or less the decisive force, what is it specifically that they remain uh, to what they still want in Syria? Uh, that would be my question. Okay, and then we'll, we'll take, uh, yes, of course. <coughs> Shoshana Bryan, Jewish Policy Center. Elon, you mentioned that the United States should be reassuring Israel, perhaps to keep the Israelis from taking military action in Syria on their own. Isn't that backwards? Aren't, aren't the Israelis much more likely to determine their own interests and actually follow their own interests? The United States clearly has not been following ours, and I think it's backwards. All right, so let's let's try to answer those four. Um, let's 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 hold off on 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 the on the Saudi Arabian question for a second. And you used to go, go. I got, I got, all right. So, so the answer uh, sort of on, on uh, the Israeli question is, look, I, I think the, the National Command Authority in the United States has a vested interest in preventing escalation uh, in southern Syria and on Israel's northern border. What form it takes to do that, uh, what assurance is significant enough that it will stay Israel's hand? Obviously, Israel has the ability to determine its own interests, and it has. Um, but whether that requires more robust missile defenses, whether that requires a deployment of U.S. troops to Israel's north, uh, whether it requires something, right, some formula. 
Uh, but that's a conversation, that's a dog that's not barking. That's really not a conversation that's happening in earnest yet. And the longer we delay having that conversation, the more there is a possibility because the traditional balance of power in the south of Syria is beginning to break down, that there will be escalation that's uncontrolled. Right? That was sort of my only point. Um, the other question is to Hillel's point about Russia. Look, I, I think I don't want you to come away with the impression that Russia doesn't have salience. But the reality is, right, from the structure of Russian forces in Syria, Iran controls the ground. And that becomes really important because Russia wants to stay in Syria indefinitely militarily, but Russia also wants to use Syria as a springboard to project power into the Eastern Med. If they don't control the ground in that space, they have to remain on Tehran's good side in order to be allowed to do that. Um, and Syria marries up, right, this sort of, this idea that they want to stay and they want others to pay for it, this marries up with what Russia's trying to do in the rest of the region, right? Because we tend to look at Syria in isolation. This is the sum total of Russian Middle East policy. It's not true. Russia is making big plays, uh, both economically and strategically, in places like Egypt, uh, in North Africa. Uh, and Syria is part of that. Because if Russia's, if the, foot, if, the, you know, if the leg is swept in Syria, if the Russians aren't allowed to stay in Syria, the rest of this stuff begins to crumble. So my sense is the Russians are very receptive to partnership with the Iranians over the long term in order to preserve that because that's the building block on which they're building everything else. Sure. On um, U.S. troop requirements, um, I haven't done a formal troop attack task analysis for what the kind of operation in southern Syria would look like, so I'm not prepared to offer you a number today. Uh, I can do that. <laughs> you can do it. Um, but um, would love, yeah, would love to know what it is. I, but I think part of what um, <clears throat> my view is that the U.S. currently has, you know, thousands of special operators and other enablers deployed in eastern Syria. Most of that force is tied up in the counter-ISIS fight, but also in trying to deter, for example, a Turkish attack on Manbij, where, you know, we have U.S. special operators deployed in part to block, you know, and, and as sort of a human shield to raise the stakes for the Turks so that they don't attack. If the U.S. can actually broker a deal with Turkey in northern Syria, it's very difficult. But if we were able to do that, it actually would become possible for the U.S. to shift the weight of our effort towards southern Syria and wider objectives. So I do think that in the near term, de-escalating the situation with Turkey above a tactical level, right, not just deterring the, the tactical fight, but actually de-escalating this issue and brokering some kind of deal with the YPG and the Turks could actually help the U.S. shift those forces into southern Syria to enable the Free Syrian Army affiliated forces that are still there and do still have combat power to use if the United States decided to support them with the adequate resources and adequate enablers. Um, in terms of Turkey and the UN ceasefire, I mean, I think Turkey's position is relatively straightforward on this. They're not on the Security Council, so they don't view themselves as bound by that resolution, despite the fact that it you know, is a UN proclamation. So I think the US should not expect the Turks actually to respond to the UN um, the UN decision when really nobody is responding to the UN decision anyway. So I think Erdogan is in good standing with the international uh, norm in effect, even though it, it technically violates the deal. So, so real quick on the back of the envelope map, what it would take, back of the em envelope math. So it's 10 US advisors for a 500 man group, and then 100 Americans to support them, whether it be a quick reaction force or something like that. So ideally you're looking at 130 Americans for every 500 men in a proxy force. You could still get away with 130 Americans for 1,500 proxy forces. But that means that 100-man force, that company, supports all three of those, those uh, proxy battalions. And that was the construct for the surge. Uh, when I was an embedded advisor, that was our, we could count on an American company to come help us whenever we needed it in our 500-man uh, Peshmerga force in Mosul. So that's the standard math. And of course, the complement, of course, is rotary wing aircraft, uh, you know, attack aircraft, close air support, and also the intelligence and, and logistic capabilities that any American force has when they do these things. But that's, that's the construct. 130, 110 Americans, ideally for a 500-man proxy force. And, and next question is we had two more questions. You gonna to wanna to tackle any of those? We tackled Israel, we tackled Turkey. Uh, again, no one's listening to the UN Security Council recommendations on ceasefires. If anything, they just add one letter of condemnation to the stack of 500 and just move on with that. I don't know how we do it unless we have the construct on the ground. But um, uh, let's see, did we answer those three? We had one question, I think, I think uh, 
that question is completely separate from this? Uh, yeah, although I, I, I would just add yeah. that, I, you know, I would like to see the U.S. discuss uh, with the Saudi delegation mm -hmm. the situation in southern Syria, where I do think that there is in part a Saudi interest with respect to constraining Iran, right? Because the continued build out of Iranian proxy forces in southern Syria is not in Saudi's interest either. Um, so I do think that there is common, you know, unity of interest in the near term um, as at least a start towards reorienting U.S. strategy in Syria more broadly. Right. Yeah, when, should, we, when you talk about U.S. strategy, sorry to interrupt. Most of the donors or the people or the countries that have interest in Syria, they always say, we need the United States to lead and we follow. So they cannot put something, or they put a lot of ideas on the table, but the United States was still, they didn't have the political will to act accordingly, uh, everybody back, back up. So I think if the Saudis come here with some ideas about whatever, and the United States doesn't have the will to go forward, that's it, this will become an idea. If the United States have an ideas, uh, that practical for the Saudis, I think the Saudis 100% will endorse it and work on it. For example, they were talking that building Raqqa and Jazeera will be very much Saudi efforts. And the Saudis say we are ready, but we need some conditions that the regime at least will not attack the city we are building. And uh, I think they didn't get enough assurance that this will happen, so they are just waiting. Yeah, that using Iraq as a test case of what happens without conditions being put on the money to reconstruct. All right, sir. I know that Russia has one more motive. It's to uh, it's Russia's Guernica. They get to test uh, all their new weapon systems, and that's pretty important. Um, Alawi comprise about 15% of Syria's population. There will be no peace in Syria unless the 15% minority dictatorship is broken. Um, there's been a, a one bullet or one cruise missile uh, solution to this problem for years. Uh, that remains the case today. I want to know if the Trump administration has or has not signed Executive Order 12333. So that's the question. I, I don't know. I don't know the answer, but I, can't, I, I do want to sort of, like a good lawyer, I want to like answer a completely different question because you, you raised it. Um, <laughs> So Alawites are actually much more than 15%. It actually goes to what Bassan was talking about, uh, which is that there's 7 million, roughly, uh, IDPs. IDPs 5 million outside. Uh, and, right, 5 million outside. Who's leaving, right? And this is part of what I was talking about when I was well, talking I, about. I used the past tense. I said that they comprise. No, no, right. But now they comprise closer to 30, 35%. Still right? a minority government. Just, well, let me answer. So they, they are a minority government. But if you are Assad and you are making a claim to legitimacy that you want the Russians and the Iranians to support, your political position is far stronger now, demographically, than it was five years ago, six years ago. And if the United States does not understand how the demographics are being changed, both indirectly and also directly through the import of uh, Shiite irregulars, then you're inclined to fall for what the Russians tell you when they come and they tell you that, well, Assad is stronger, he's sort of, we have to have him, we can't change anything. Right? That's sort of what I was talking about when I was talking about the fact that like, we have to be asking the right questions. In order to get the right answers, we have to ask the right questions. Right. right. So we're, we're getting right up to the, to the moment. You ask your question, sir, and then we'll try to answer it as soon as possible. Thank you. Uh, Be Rob respectful Howard. of people's time. <laughs> of course. Rob Harrison from the National War College. Just looking at the delineation of colours on that map, to what extent uh, is a political federated solution part of uh, a realistic end state for, uh, for the country? Boss. Most of the guys who think about federation, they try to paraphrase it to have decentralization. Uh, federations, if you start by Syria, you will never end in the Middle East. You go to Lebanon, to go to Turkey, to go to Iraq, go to Iran. So even many people, they talk about federation or confederation. In reality, when they go deep in, in Geneva, in the talks, they do about decentralization, just to avoid the consequences of the regional part. Decentralization will protect the, the Kurdish rights without <laughs> Uh, sacrificing the Syrian state. And that goes to the Druze, maybe it goes to the Alawite, it goes to the South, it goes to the North, it goes to Lebanon maybe one day, or to Iraq in a way. The, the major thing that no one wants to see the shape, reshaping the map, the Syria map, because that will open the doors again to the whole Middle East. Um, so I, that's what I, most of the people try to use decentralization rather than federation or confederation. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. I, I want to be respectful of people's time. I'd like to thank my, my panelists for being, on, being here at Hudson. Thank Tech. you for everyone here. Yeah. And thank you all for coming as well. And I think some are going to stick around.